and welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab, we're going to be developing a serverless JavaScript application, and we're going to host that on Amazon S3 and, and front it with CloudFront. In the application, we're going to be using the login with Amazon Software Development Kit, and that will allow our users of our application to use their Amazon login details to assume a role which will give them temporary AWS credentials. Then we're going to use those temporary credentials to read and write to a DynamoDB table. Okay, starting off in the Amazon S3 console, we want to create a bucket to host our website. So create bucket, we'll give that a name. And next. And next again. So we want to make this public. So grant public read access to this bucket and create bucket. Okay, so in the lab notes, I've got some links to two files, one called index.html being our web page and app.js being our application code. So what we need to do is to download those and then load, upload these to our bucket. So we'll just click on the bucket now and we'll upload those two files. And next, we need to grant public permissions for this. And upload. So once that's finished uploading, we need to enable static website hosting. So go into properties and static website hosting. We'll put that in there, put our index.html and click save. Okay, so now that we've done that, we should be able to go to this website now and just have a look at it, make sure it's all working. So that's working fine. So what, what our web page simply is, it's going to have three buttons there, one which is a login with Amazon button, a log out button, and then a write to DynamoDB. So once we've finished logging in, we can write data to, or we're going to get the user profile data from the Amazon.com service, and then we're going to write that to a DynamoDB database. To have this running properly, we need to have it served out of HTTPS domain. So obviously we can't do that using static website hosting, but we can if we front that with CloudFront. So we're going to do a CloudFront distribution. So go into CloudFront. And we're just going to use the standard CloudFront certificate as well. So we go create distribution and get started. The origin will be our bucket that we just created and we want to redirect everything to HTTPS. The reason we need to do this is that the login with Amazon service will only work with a domain that is under HTTPS or SSL. And we're just going to use a standard SSL certificate. And the default root object will be index.html and we'll create that distribution. Okay, so while that CloudFront distribution is happening, I'm just going to jump into the Amazon.com Seller Central. Now, there's instructions in the lab notes on how to register with Amazon.com as a developer. So you need to go through that registration process. Once you've done that and you've logged in as a developer on Amazon.com, you'll be presented with this screen here. So what we need to do is that we need to register our application with Amazon. And once we've done that and we've given all the details of the domain name and all of that sort of thing, what we will get is an application ID and we'll also get a web client ID. And we need both of those IDs. One of them goes to Amazon. Oh, sorry, it goes to Amazon Web Services, which is the application ID, and the other one goes on our web page, which will be the client ID. So to start with, we go to register new application. We'll give our application a name. And we'll give it a description. And we need to put in a privacy notice URL as well. So I've just got one here that I've just copied off the internet, it's just a sample one. And I'm just going to put that in there, which I've uploaded already to uh, an S3 bucket. And I'm just going to say, uh, put in a logo as well. I can, I might as well put in a logo, why not? 
And we'll save that. Okay, so that's done that part of it. So what we need to do now is put in the web settings and that's going to give them or give Amazon the settings of our application that we'll be running. So it's going to be a web application for starters. It's not going to be an Android app or an iOS app. So we click on web settings. And what we need to do is edit that. And we need to put our origin of our domain. So that's going to be our CloudFront domain. So we go back into the CloudFront manager. We'll copy that domain. Okay, so it needs to have the HTTPS colon uh, forward slash forward slash in there as well. And the last bit of it will be cloudfront.net. So that's all you need to do for that and save. Okay, so you've now got your client ID and you've got your application ID that you need to go further. So we'll just jump back now into the CloudFront and see how that's going. Okay, so CloudFront has finished creating that distribution. So we'll just jump in here and have a look and see if it's working. So that's fine. So we've got that uh, up and running on CloudFront, not a problem. So what we'll do now is move on to the next step, which is creating our DynamoDB table. So go to Services and DynamoDB. And we want to create a table. And we'll call it Login with Amazon Test. Now, use the same table name as I've got here uh, because the code is actually around this table name. Otherwise, you'll have to go into the code and change it. So our primary key, again, leave this the same as what I've got in the lab notes, which is just custom with a capital C. So just remember it is case sensitive, so make sure that customer is a capital C there. We're not going to use the default settings because I want to save a bit of money. So what I'm going to do is turn off auto scaling because we really only need one read capacity unit. And we'll just change that to the minimum and save a bit of cost. So if we forget to delete this, it's only going to cost us 60 cents a month. So not a problem. And we create that, that table. And that's now been created. After a certain amount of time, it will be ready to go. Okay, jumping into tables, and we can see there that it is now active. So I'm just going to click on that again. What we need to do now is that we need to create an IAM role that will give our end users, or our end users can assume, uh, that will give them federated temporary access to this table so they can read and write to that table. So we're just going to go to the tab that has access control. We're going to select login with Amazon, which is what we're using. We'll select all of the actions there and we'll create this policy. So there it has automatically created that policy for us, which has saved us a lot of time, means that we don't get many mistakes in here. So all we need to do now is to copy that policy over to IAM and then we can create an IAM role using that policy. So the first thing we need to do is just copy all of that. So Control A and Control C or Command A, Command C if you're on Mac. And we'll go to the IAM console now. And we go to roles. Actually, first of all, we'll go to policies. And we'll create a policy. And we'll paste in, we'll delete what's in there now, and we'll paste in our, our JSON code in there. So let's have a look at it. So what we've got is... We're allowing all of the actions there on DynamoDP and it's going to be on our login with Amazon test database or sorry, our test table. And it's only going to be, it's got a, it's a condition against it. So it's only going to be allowed where the leading keys have user ID. So what that means is that our primary key of our database is customer. And so where the customer is has the has the uh, the value of our Amazon account or the user's Amazon account, they can write to that, but they can't write to anything else. So it's limited to uh, entries on their own account. So I just click on review policy. We'll give that a name. And we'll give it a description as well. 
Okay. So there we can see it's got uh, limited read and write access. And on the resource, log in with Amazon Tests, that table. And it's only going to be where the leading keys or the partition, which is customer, where the customer equals the Amazon.com user ID that has been logged in. So we just create that policy now. Okay, so that's been created now. So now we can create a role using that policy. So create role, and we want to do web identity. Our identity provider will be login with Amazon and our application ID. So we, we need to get this application ID from amazon.com, from our developer account. So we go back into our developer account and we can see up the top here, we've got our application ID. So we've got two IDs. We've got an application ID and we've got a client ID. So for this part of the process, we use the application ID. So we're just going to select all of that and copy that over. And go to permissions. Now this is where we search for our policy. So I'm just going to do login. You should find it. So there's our policy that we just created. And we review. We'll give this role a name. We'll just call it login with Amazon DynamoDB. Again, that will be fine. And a description in there. And that looks fine. So we've got our policy there, which is our login with Amazon DynamoDB policy. Uh, we've got our identity provider is Amazon.com. And we just click on create role. Okay, so that role has now been created. So if we click up here to that role, to get to that role. We can see here we've got a role ARN. So we're going to need that later on in our code. And what we'll do is we'll jump into our code and we'll put that in there now. So just copying that now. And I'm just going to jump into my app.js code that we uploaded. And we can see here we have a variable role ARN. So we need to put our ARN for our role into there. So that's done. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save that as a different name. And I'm going to call it ver or app underscore version two. Now the reason I'm doing that is because we've got a CloudFront distribution. And so if we're going to just keep using app.js and we upload app.js, we're going to have to invalidate that CloudFront distribution, which is going to take a long, long time. You know, I haven't actually measured it, but you're probably looking at half an hour or so to invalidate that CloudFront distribution. So instead of doing that, we just need to upload a new file. And this is what that is. And so if it's not in the distribution, it will just get proxied straight back to Amazon S3 and, uh, and it'll go from there. So we'll just save that as version two. I'll just copy the name first and save that. And I need to go into index.html and scroll down to here because this is referencing app.js. So we need to put the new file name, which will be app version 2.js. And we also, if you see here, we need to put in our client ID. So if we go back into the amazon.com seller central, if we scroll down here in our web settings, we're going to have a client ID. So we select that. So don't get this confused with the application ID that we used before. This is a client ID. And we'll put that in here. Okay. So that should be fine to run. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to file save that as another version as well. And save. So all we need to do now is upload that and run our application. So we go into the S3 management console. And upload that. And again, make sure that we've got public permissions on this. 
and upload that. Now, before we run this application, let's have a quick look and see how it all works. So in our index.html or version two that we've got here, we can see it's just a blank, pretty well a blank canvas here, which has just got some buttons on it. So we start off by loading the Amazon or the login with Amazon JavaScript SDK. And when it has been loaded, we then pass our client ID to the software development kit. Now, that is going to be our web client ID. If this was an Android app, it would be our Android client ID, or it would be our, if it was an iOS app, it would be our iOS client ID there. So because it's a web application, we're sending our web client ID to that. So once it has been loaded, we've also got here some buttons uh, for login and for logout and writing to the database. We're just loading jQuery and the Amazon or the AWS software development kit. And then finally, we're loading in our app.js or app version two here, uh, JS code. So let's have a look. So not much going on there other than loading in our login for Amazon JavaScript SDK. So if we go to our app, there's a lot more going on there. So first of all, we've got to define our region as US East. We've also got a variable there for our role ARN, which we'll be passing to the AWS simple token service or secure token service. And we've got our event listeners for those three buttons being our login with Amazon, which will go to a login with Amazon function, which is down here. If we want to log out, it's going to call uh, the login function within the Amazon SDK. And finally, we can write to DynamoDB using a write DynamoDB function, which we're creating as well. So when we log in and we click on that login function, the first thing or login button, the first thing we want to do is define the scope of our call to Amazon.com. And that will be to retrieve the profile. And that will be the email address and the name of our end user. So what we need to do is that we need to run the authorize process. And if that is successful, it will open up a pop-up screen and or pop-up window. And we put in our amazon.com username and password to that. If it's accepted, then we will get a, a good response back, an okay response, not an error. And in that response, we will get an access token from amazon.com. So we can use that access token that we get from amazon.com for two things. First of all, we can go back to the login with Amazon service and we can retrieve the user profile information for the person that's just logged in. And so that again, will get us our name and email address of that person. So that's what we're doing here is that we're calling retrieve profile and we're passing that access token there. And in our response, we're going to get the user profile of that person. So if that is successful, then we go on to create our AWS credentials. So that will, again, it will be similar to what we do with Cognito, but instead of using the Cognito service, we're going to be using web identity credentials. And what we do is we, we pass the provider, which will be amazon.com, the ARN for our IAM role. And finally, we're going to pass the access token that we got from login with Amazon. So once we've created that object, we can refresh our AWS credentials and we'll load, reload that in. And so if that is successful, then we're going to create a DynamoDB object that we can use for calling to the DynamoDB service. So when we click on that right DynamoDB button, what it's going to do is it's going to write to DynamoDB the user profile information, and it's also going to put in the top score information for that user. So how does that work? So we're going to define some parameters for our item that we're writing, and it's going to be customer, which if you remember we, when we created our DynamoDB table, customer was the primary key for that table. And if you remember when we created our role, the 
access had a condition that the or the primary key being customer must have been the same as the user that is logging in their amazon.com ID. So what we're doing is that we're supplying the amazon.com ID to customer in that item. So that will be accepted uh, by AWS. We're also putting in the email address for the person and the name of the person, and we're putting in some top score information. So I'm just putting in zero there. Uh, but if this was a real thing, you would put in the top score information for their game or whatever they're doing. And once we've done that, we can call put item. And if that is okay, it will just well, stringify that out and put it uh, out to the, to the console on our screen. So that's how it all works. And what we'll do now is that we'll go ahead and run that. So jumping back in the CloudFront Manager, let's have a look at our new website. So we go to here. Now this is going to be the index.html, so we don't want this one. This is the old one. We want to go to the new one, which will be our version 2, which is there. So what's happened now is that because it's not in our CloudFront distribution, CloudFront has just proxied that straight back to Amazon S3, and we've got that up and running. If we used index.html, we would have had to invalidate that CloudFront distribution, would have wasted a lot of time. So what we can do now is we'll run this application. It's going to press F12 to get the console up, and click on Login with Amazon and see what happens. So there we go. So I just put in my password. So it's asking for access to my profile. So, so by logging into this web application, the web application is going to receive my name and my email address. And so I'm going to allow that. Okay, so we can see here, you are now signed in. So everything has worked fine. So we've got in here, don't worry about this a mismatch or a match is not a function, this uncaught type error. That's just a problem with the login. It's not a problem with our code. So looking here, we've got our Amazon login details. And so what's happened is it's returned an access token. So that's a login with Amazon access token. And we can pass that access token over to the AWS STS service using Web Identity Federation. And what it will do is it will create temporary credentials for us. And so we can see here, we've grabbed that access token and we've got our role here that is being used. And we're calling uh, Assume Web Identity Federation with that access token. And it has successfully created the AWS te temporary credentials for us. So what we can do now is I'm just going to clear the console is that we should be able to now grab that profile information that has that we've received, which will have my name and my email address, and we can write that to Dynamo, DynamoDB. So let's have a look at how that goes. So just click on Write to DynamoDB. So there we go. If it worked, it will, res, it will return consumed capacity. So it's just saying here the table, and we've consumed one capacity unit. And it's written it with the Amazon account there. So what's happened now? is that we should be able to go into DynamoDB and there should be an entry for this user with that Amazon account under, under customer. So let's have a look. We'll jump into DynamoDB and we'll click on items. And there we can see we've got customer, which was, as you remember, when we created this table, our primary key was customer. And so whatever is in here is provided it's got the Amazon account for the person that has logged in with those temporary security credentials, they can write to here, but they cannot write to any other place within the database. So here you can see, there, so there's my Amazon account ID. There's my email. There's my name. And we've also written in their top score. So if you wanted to put any further details of that user, you can put that in. So it's a, if it's a game and you want to keep track of their top score of the game, that's how you do it. So that's how simple and easy it is to use federated identity. Now, why would you want to do that? Why not just use Cognito? Well, the thing is, Cognito, it costs you money. And 
you have to pay for that. So you might be a cash-strapped startup and you've got the next best thing and you know that the people that are using your web application have an Amazon account or they have a Facebook account or a Google account and you can use that to authorize them and it's not going to cost you anything to do that. And so by doing that, then you can also expand quite rapidly. So if your, your app becomes extremely popular, your application is going to be running on their end user's hardware. It's going to be running on their computer or their mobile phone or whatever. You're not paying for that compute capacity, but all you're paying for is the data, the back end being that DynamoDB database, and they're accessing that directly without any EC2 instances, without anything like that in front of it. They're accessing that directly uh, and doing that extremely securely as well. So that brings us to the end of a pretty good lab, I think. And what we need to do now is to clean it all up. So the first thing we will do is that we will delete this table. So when that's chugging away, we then need to disable this CloudFront distribution. So that will take a while to disable. So once it's disabled, then we can go back in there and we will be able to, this delete will be, uh, will be highlighted so we can delete it. That'll take about 15 minutes or so. And we just delete this bucket. Okay, so that's all cleaned up and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab.